So welcome to monetizing the multi-screen consumer experience. And I'll just read a brief intro before we uh, have our panelists introduce themselves. Consumers are increasingly using mobile devices to watch professionally produced content, and video distributors are responding with a variety of offers, including TV Everywhere to enhance traditional pay TV, VOD libraries available over the top, and even live channel packages available over the top. In many cases, these offers are being targeted primarily to mobile device viewing, but may also be complementary to a TV viewing experience. This session discusses these trends and opportunities to monetize multi-screen viewing, including subscriptions, rentals, electronic sell-through, and advertising. Uh, so I am going to uh, now, with that, ask the uh, panelists to introduce themselves. First, uh, Tony. Hi, I'm Tony Peterson with uh, Discovery Communications. I head up the product group for the US TV Nets. Um, thanks for the invitation. Happy to join you guys today. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mike Green. I run marketing and business development for the media group at Brightcove. Uh, Brightcove is an uh, online video platform by sort of legacy name. Uh, it's evolved to be a lot more than that. We get to work with a lot of great customers and uh, creating their video experiences, including uh, Tony. Uh, and so thanks again for having us here. Thank you. My name is Mike Lucero. I work for Ratio uh, it's, uh, up in Seattle. Uh, we are a company that develops uh, end user uh, applications for uh, connected TVs and uh, mobile devices. And uh, we've been building, we've been in the media business for, in the video business for years now, about uh, um, four or five years. Um, with a, we've cut our teeth on the Xbox, and now we've expanded to Apple TV, Fire TV, and Roku, and a bunch of other um, platforms, and obviously mobile and uh, and a tablet as well. And uh, we're excited to be here. We have a lot to share with you, and hopefully this will be valuable. And for those of you who came just to hear Mara, I apologize. She was unable to attend at the last minute, but the rest of us will try to uh, make up for that. Uh, and to introduce myself, I'm Jonathan Hurd, a director with Altman Valandry & Company. We're a technology, media, telecom-focused strategy consulting firm. <clears throat> and uh, just to kick it off with a couple of fact, uh, we do an annual consumer video survey at Altman Valandry, and in the last year's version of it, last summer, and we're about to field the next one, uh, more than 40% of consumers under age 45 say that they use a tablet to watch TV shows and movies at least weekly. And when you look at the numbers over time, it has just exploded. And that's not of tablet owners, that's of everybody. With smartphones, they skew a little bit younger, but more than 40% of consumers under age 35 watch TV shows and movies weekly on a smartphone. So we are seeing an explosion of the multi-screen experience with all of this mobile usage. And you know, maybe uh, panelists, you could kick it off by talking about, you know, are there sort of some obvious uh, monetization opportunities here beyond some of the things that might require more sophistication. I know there's some points of view that you all have on that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's no doubt that mobile is very important uh, <clears throat> all over the world, but, but especially in the US market. I mean, we're seeing on our websites now, uh, over 50% of the traffic is coming from mobile devices. So uh, ignore that at your own peril because people will be very disappointed. It also means that you know a lot of videos being consumed on mobile devices. Um, you know, we've had a big project over the last couple of years to make all of our websites uh, in the US responsive. Um, we've actually gone through a process, uh, which not many media companies have done, of making sure that uh, our entire web offering is one common code base. So it's for our 10 networks, 10 instances of the one common code base, all using the one instance of the broker player, um, so that we know that you know, across our whole network and across our whole offering, uh, people are getting great video quality. Um, we're not using a bunch of different players or a bunch of different versions of different players. Uh, and it's really important, uh, really, really important to be thinking about. Also, it's really important to make sure that uh, you have a, a, a really deep integration with whoever your uh, advertising provider is, so um, free will or, or double click or, or whoever you choose. Um, and by having one instance of a player fully integrated with that, uh, that ad network, you can make sure that you're trafficking ads effectively, people are seeing the ads, making sure that you have competitive separation between your video ads and your display ads on the page. So, you know, for, for a business like ours, which is particularly reliant on uh, ad revenue, those are some of the things that you should be thinking about. 
I think from the Breitkopf perspective, we find ourselves in the middle of the technology layer that helps someone like Discovery connect their content to their audience. And there are a couple pieces in there in that technology layer. And you mentioned free will and double click. And I guess as I see it, there's sort of two swim lanes. We sometimes say that we're in the video workflow swim lane, and they're in the uh, kind of connecting audience or identifying audience across platforms swim lane. You know, when it comes to things like universal frequency capping, that's more of like a, a free will concern, perhaps, or double click concern. But it is really important to, to Tony's point that I think we as the OVP or as the player have the really strong integration with those types of uh, companies. Um, you know, Bright Cove has been around 10 years, and in that time we've developed a really rich ecosystem of partners. There's probably 300 or so partners connected to our, our platform, but certain ones, free will like you guys use, touch a, a very broad uh, set of our media customer base. And so we pay extra special sort of attention to making sure that that's right across platforms, that they have plugins for all the Bright Cove SDKs and that sort of thing, so that, uh, so that the monetization is there. To justify the business. Yeah, Tony brings up a really interesting point that we're seeing across our customer base right now as well, which is this notion of having a single operational code base. You know, getting scale on those endpoints, um, whether it's uh, connected TVs or or mobile devices and tablets, is a trend that's happening with a lot of our customers right now. Uh, one of the examples um, is Pokemon, who for whom we built their initial iOS and Android apps, um, and they were less. Um, they, they, they were less about pure video consumption. They were just apps to get apps out there. Uh, then we built their apps for Fire TV and Roku. And now they want to modernize their platforms to make their iOS and Android apps more efficient and more um, monetizable from a, from a business um, objectives perspective. So we're seeing a lot of our customers now looking at the entire footprint of, of endpoints and thinking about it holistically and trying to up-level all of their monetization across all those endpoints. So that's a trend we see. And scalability is really, you know, this is the, you know, the third platform um, that these folks need to uh, really be successful at for ma making money. And they historically hadn't made as much money there, um, particularly with, uh, in the case of Pokemon, with display ads. And now they're getting um, video ads there, uh, which obviously have much better um, CPMs. So that is driving a lot of that behavior. Yeah, could you talk about, so let's stick with the advertising uh, theme before we get into some of the other areas here, but uh, in terms of advertising CPMs on mobile, what are some of the trends there? I, you know, Mike, one of the points you made before uh, the, uh, before the uh, panel was that it's hiding in plain sight, this mobile monetization. Yes, you know, it's really, it's actually, again, if you look at what I've worked on historically, um, starting with the Xbox, um, where uh, we really saw there that the CPMs were, you know, TV-like and, and broadcast-like. You know, that built obviously a huge um, seventy million dollar business around video ads, and that's all again about scale. You, know, you have a thirty-second TV spot, and you want to get that into as many places as you want. And there's a vibrant marketplace out there, you know, with programmatic buying, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, what's happened in mobile in the past um, in the past uh, year year plus is that that those CPMs are translating now into the video space as well. So. Um, obviously, that means that content and that viewership has much more value from an economic standpoint. It's no longer the digital pennies, but now it's, you know, it's the equivalent of the analog dollars. And um, what's also interesting is that uh, what we're seeing is that the more successful programmers are tuning their experiences a bit for that experience. Obviously, it's shorter form content. Um, you know, there's different um, uh, sort of nuanced changes you make to the user experience that make it more for the, for the mobile user. And the programmers that are making sense of that um, sort of demand from customers are the ones that are going to be more successful in terms of monetizing through advertising specifically. Uh, there's, an, there's an interesting trade-off, I think, in some of what Mike was saying on this point, which is that if you can get additional distribution for quality video content on mobile and find a way to successfully monetize it, and there are all sorts of things I guess we can talk about that may break the chain when it comes to monetizing mobile, but that the CPMs are plenty good, that you don't need to do all that much in the way of tricks. Uh, and there's lots of really creative things that people are doing on your platform, certainly like in the connected TV environment. And Discovery, being a creative company the way they are, can do all sorts of interesting things. We've got examples of that. But even just by getting to all the right places and just having a strategy to do that with your you know, regular sort of desktop monetization strategy intact is a big win, given that there's demand for it. Premium uh, you know, publishers are all pretty much well sold out, even on mobile, and CPMs are fairly high. So Okay, sorry. I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it's a really simple point, but, you know, until someone sees an ad, you don't get paid. So, um, you know, if something breaks in the chain and, and ads aren't actually getting delivered in your mobile video, then no one's getting paid. So, 
it's, it, it's really important to have systems in place to make sure that one, you know if ads aren't being delivered um, and, and to be able to fix that stuff pretty quickly. Yeah, we, we had some research on this recently. Uh, we actually did it with streaming media and um, I wish I could kind of quote it back in off the top of my head, but I think it was something like 66% of the respondents said that they're monetizing less than 10% of their mobile video. Mm. Uh, and I don't know if that was just that if mm. it's a lot of it being consumed on mobile web, then they didn't have the proper integrations to ensure that a V paid ad or another rich media ad wouldn't try to be delivered there that would break the experience. So there's any number of things, again, that may cause uh, breakage. Uh, and so we've really been focused on trying to help our customer base understand their options uh, for, you know, best practices in terms of using SDKs where applicable, or maybe taking a server-side approach to ensure that ads are stitched into content so it's just one stream delivered seamlessly to any you know, mobile endpoint, including longer tail mobile devices outside of Android and iOS and so forth. So getting ads there on mobile with the higher CPMs, getting them uh, there reliably. <clears throat> but um, Mike, you mentioned some creative things that are going on, uh, either Mike or Tony, <laughs> uh, around uh, you know, going beyond just having uh, a, an ad appear like what are what what can you do with the mobile platform to make ads more engaging uh, or make your consumers more engaged well in the um, so there, there's a couple things um, at, a, at a very simple level um, again I sort of alluded to this earlier when I talked about form, f focusing more on short form content and it does go back to the user experience like there's a lot of concern um, typically with publishers that they don't want to you know um, turn off the user too quickly with and overburden them with ads so, and with short form content, that gets trickier, but um, what we've even done on, on, on televisions, but that's even more applicable on, on mobile devices is, is just running, doing what we call a playlist, where you basically, you know, you, you run short form content um, back to back and you stick ads in between it. And that assures that there's gonna be monetization and it's a good user experience. And you don't necessarily start with a pre-roll. You don't wanna turn people off right away. You wanna get them into the content and then run ads in between, just like you know, sort of a typical TV experience would go. So that's kind of what I call the basic scenarios. Um, if you want to get more advanced, though, on mobile, you obviously have a whole other, and this is probably more in the 12 to 24 month time frame. But you know, since you're on, it's a mobile device and there's more data associated with it, including things like LBS, um, you, know, you can do some more interesting things around location. Uh, we actually did an interesting demo with Microsoft at CES where we showed, uh, it was called the armchair dial. Um, uh, uh, demo, and we basically did a. It, it took a. Um, it was actually on the. It, it was on the Xbox, um, where we simulated uh, one of our customers, um, the whistle, uh, having a piece of content that was um, that was locked on the Xbox, and then you had to download a mobile app in order to unlock that content, go to a store, buy something, and then you came back to the Xbox and it was unlocked. So, and and in the store it was triggered by a beacon. So you know, you're able to take the LBS technology, cause an event um, then, that then uh, through the cloud triggers something um, on the back end on the Xbox um, server. So that's a very bespoke experience that doesn't, doesn't scale very well, but it's still an interesting scenario. And as those scenarios start scaling, the fact that there's mobility suddenly opens up a whole new set of opportunities and experiences. So I'd say in the next 12 to 24 months, look for that to actually scale and become interesting. <clears throat> What about the fact that these mobile devices are, have interactive capabilities? You know, they're more personal, touch screens, et cetera. Uh, what have you seen at, and maybe Discovery, you've done some things around interactivity of uh, a video? Yeah, just, just uh, you know, on a, on a broader note, I, I, I had the end of the, the, last, uh, the, the last talk and those guys were talking about how complex it is and how difficult it is to get on all these devices now. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting because it is, you know, it's, it's still not easy, but for those who've been doing it for a long time, um, it's never been easier and that should be really exciting for all of you guys because if you want to get a product out on all, all, the, all of these devices now, um, you know, there are a number of platforms that can give you everything from encoding to distribution to a client to uh, ad solutions to um, payment methods um, to, to some of this fun stuff that we're talking about, some of these interactive features. Um, so it's, it's actually never been easier as long as you have some sort of significant budget to do it. I mean, it, it, it's still not cheap. Um, there's a lot of players in the market and it is getting cheaper, but um, it also opens the, 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 the path for uh, all of you guys and, and all of us to, to be doing products that are sort of more niche and more for the super fans. And that's something that Discovery has definitely been, been doing a lot and will be concentrating a lot in the future. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Well, one which is my favorite is uh, we just had a live cam for a giraffe birth. Um, which is pretty cool. 
I had no idea that a giraffe when it's born f falls like six feet onto the ground and is totally fine. So don't worry about the baby giraffe, the baby giraffe is okay. But there have been like uh, millions and millions of, of Americans who've like tuned in to watch a baby giraffe birth. Now that's a very niche little piece of interest there. So you know that anyone tuning in there is intensely interested in animals for a start and probably intensely interested in giraffes as well, I'm, I'm guessing, so to, to take the time to watch a, a live giraffe birth. So the, the, uh, the advertising experiences that you can give these people um, can be really targeted, um, have an amazing CPM and, and can be really fun as well. Were there mid-rolls? <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be careful with the mid-roll in a draft berth because, you know, it happens, you pretty, miss it, right? happens pretty fast. Um, but, but that's a really good point. I mean, you know, you need the flexibility to, to be able to insert mid-rolls um, <laughs> at will. Right, right the red button. So um, I, think, I think, you know, some of those experiences are pretty interesting. Some other experiences that we've been playing with are, are, are platforms like, a, there's a platform called Adways, and there, there are a few of these. Um, and you'll see something uh, using Adways and Brackhove coming up pretty, pretty soon, uh, launching in the next few days. But these are intense super fan experiences where you can have some video and you're going to have hotspots within the video that people can interact with and play you know, something about a particular piece of that video, some background on you know, what happened leading up to the draft birth, for example. Um, so I, I think some of that stuff is really interesting and really well targeted and, and pretty exciting for the industry. Well, if you've got big enough content, and I know that you did right. the Adways thing in the past with Shark Week, which drew enough scale that you could do that, and you had Gillette uh, as the integrated advertiser where the hotspot you know, could turn to a piece of sponsored content, a video within right. a video, and things like that. Um, if you have you know, big enough content, then the scale is there. And, and actually, Adways is an example of one of those technologies that's built into the platform. If you want to add it as an interactive layer to your player, you can do that and bring an advertiser to the party, I guess. So one of the things that when people first started buying tablets, using tablets, uh, there was this prediction or discussion around, hey, it's a companion device. You know, while you're watching TV, you'll have some complementary content that is interactive. And, you know, with the exception of uh, <clears throat> sports statistics or fantasy leagues or whatever, none of that is really caught on. I'm curious what your... Uh, points of view are on, you know, is it something that's going to happen in the future still, or are there fundamental reasons why we haven't seen the uh, mobile devices as a companion <clears throat> to the traditional TV? Well, I mean, I mean it's great that, um, it's great for us that what, you know, we've dedicated our life to working on isn't a companion, right? <laughs> it's, it's actually turning into a real distribution channel that people are consuming, you know, the main event on, which, which is great. I think uh, you know we've all played with uh, companion experiences, and some of those have been moderately successful. And I, I think some, you know, relating to like big game shows and big sporting events, have been wildly successful um, at times. Uh, I think from experiences with with sort of serialized or long-running week-to-week shows, um, we sort of found that the the amount of effort you need to put into promotion to get people to keep turning up week to week and opening these companion applications kind of was out of whack with the amount of people who are actually turning up week to week. So, um, you know, you've got to weigh it up against the, the size of the, the event and, you know, how much promotion the event's getting on the whole. Uh, and I think big events, those sort of experiences can still be really fun and really form community and, and get people really involved. So an Oscars or an MTV VMAs or those sort of events, um, you know, those sort of companion apps can be pretty, su pretty successful. The companion app experience that we've seen that ties to this panel that, I mean, it's not rocket science, it is in fact sports, to your point, uh, but a lot of people have done, um, you know, EVS, for example, a partner Bright Coves offers a, uh, a, a program called CCAST or an application called CCAST, which on a tablet, let's say if you're watching the broadcast feed on your TV in your living room, you can get the subsequent camera angles all in an iPad experience. Uh, and they've done a good job of offering the ability to wrap sponsors around the camera that follows Messi around or something like that. And, and that's where there's enough scale for like, you know, World Cup. Uh, I think Sony India may have done that for World Cup. I know that uh, one of the case studies we have on our website is a big rugby tournament in Australia that shows how they did that, and there's a monetization experience there, which again, uh, if it's a wrapped, sponsored type of thing, you don't have to worry about a lot of the ad-serving integrations on, mm -hmm. on mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it just goes back to scale. It's like without, I worked on the smart glass that the Xbox had with lots of fanfare a few E3s ago, and uh, there was some amazing scenarios that were really expensive to build and unless you have unless you can justify it from a monetary perspective you know, and it was actually designed for scale it was designed to sort of suck up your web experiences and turn them into an app but that without the investment in making it special is just not enough to make it compelling so 
Um, yeah, I think it's going to be you know the, the five to ten percent of the super big events that are going to be successful. But uh, I think there's still an opportunity for for the killer app in second screen, and you know we at Ratio intend to keep experimenting and try to find some of those things. But it's not painfully obvious where what that is, and it's we know a lot of places that where it's not. <laughs> right, right, and uh, we're talking ahead of the panel about perhaps. There may even be, you know, it's not the second screen necessarily, but the second device that you might interact with uh, some kind of haptic uh, interface on an on a Apple Watch or something that in, engages you with other senses, perhaps, uh, other than, you know, taking your attention away from the big screen and looking at a smaller screen. Uh, it's more a complementary kind of a, you know, you can watch one thing and feel something else. Uh, so perhaps there's, there's an opportunity there. Um, going back to another form of monetization, which is just getting traditional TV subscribers to retain their subscriptions. Uh, so customer retention, the whole TV everywhere approach, the authenticated viewing that uh, cable operators or MVPDs more broadly are using. Um, you know, there's certainly a, some very compelling experiences that are coming out there from certain cable operators, still a relative lack of awareness of, of many of these uh, capabilities. But you know, what are you seeing there that's, that's particularly uh, compelling? And Tony, maybe from a uh, you know, discovery point of view, to what extent is authenticated viewing important versus you know, just having that direct relationship with consumers? Yeah, so I'm not here to uh, announce any new products, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, you know, if you look across the the, um, the landscape of MVPDs and programmers, uh, there's some really successful um, TVE applications out there. And when I worked at Viacom, uh, we released a bunch of them, really successful. And you know, from what I hear from talking to uh, other colleagues in the industry, um, authentication rates are, are climbing at a pretty rapid pace uh, across the board for for TVE applications. So. Um, you know, I, I think there's still some challenges there. There's, you know, the, the whole uh, MVPD uh, login and password is, is something that many people haven't used since they signed up for their cable subscription, in some cases many, many years ago. So um, there's not a whole lot of awareness there, and people sometimes have to go digging for those credentials, uh, whereas it's not you know, like something that they've signed up for in the last, last couple of years in many cases. Uh, so, so that's that's you know can be a bit of a barrier to to, to authentication. Um, I think you know the industry as a whole is, is working on that. Um, you know concepts like uh, home-based authentication, where you can look at a range of IP addresses and find out you know if you if you're um, connecting to an MVPD and then signing you up automatically without even having to put in any credentials uh, is really exciting for the industry. And I, I think you'll see a lot more of that, uh, that sort of innovation come up as far as TVE goes. And especially you know, with, with some big events like the, the, the World Cup football and, and Olympics, um, many people who had never really messed with TVE uh, found themselves signing up and, and understanding that you know, it's, it's a pretty easy system. Uh, and you know, just for, as an industry, it's, uh, there's a lot of benefit there for, the, for the, both the cable operators and the uh, programmers to, to have some sort of association like that. I think related to that, uh, if you're going to ask me kind of what are the most exciting opportunities for mobile monetization, it would be live 24-7 streaming and the viewing of that out of home being entirely incremental. Uh, if you can solve for the monetization question there, that's something obviously that uh, a lot of people who just came back from NAB and, and you know, Breakov amongst others spent a lot of time talking about 24 by 7 live streaming with dynamic ad insertion if somebody wants it. And it's in a TVE sense. Uh, the question sometimes becomes, do you swap out the linear ad load, which qualifies you for your Nielsen C3 rating, with dynamically targeted ads, which may, on a CPM basis, maybe make you more money. Mm -hmm. I think the jury's still out on, on that one. But again, a lot of that viewing, if you can solve for it, is, is incremental and an opportunity for mobile monetization, no question. Yeah, I mean, there's so much volume of viewing, as you mentioned, Tony, 50% you know, is, is through that type of behavior. So you know, for, for the, for the um, yeah the network um, uh, distributors. So you gotta be able to figure out how to monetize that and make sure that it's in line with your, with your MVPD deals. So that's, solving that is absolutely critical. Yeah, you know, one other good thing that's working in our favor on that one, I think, is that, at least in Boston, where, where I live, I mean, Xfinity hotspots are now everywhere. So you're trying to offload a lot of that uh, data usage that would otherwise eat away your data plan if you wanna watch, you know, uh, watch ESPN while you're, you're at your kid's soccer game or something like that, you know, you can, you can do that and, and, and maybe you'd be covered by a hotspot and not be eating up your data plan. <clears throat> yeah, and, and not to uh, tout 
Comcast specifically of any MVPDs, but they do have uh, the most, I, I think it's widely believed, the most heavily used uh, TV everywhere set of applications for, of any MVPD. And just in the last year, and this is very much from a consumer perspective, but a couple of things that I really um, have found incredibly valuable that, that make me want to keep a cable subscription. I think one is being able to watch a different channel from what's on the set-top box on a tablet. So my wife can be watching one thing in the living room, I can be my, on, in my office with a tablet watching the Red Sox. Uh, another thing is being able to download, depending on who, uh, who the content uh, owner is, being able to download some apps or some programs rather to a tablet, watch them later. And so that, you know, these are just things that didn't exist a year ago. So the, the experience for consumers is becoming a lot more engaging as well. Yeah, and I think that's super important because if, if you've ever talked to an MVPD, what they care about is putting value into the cable bill. You know, you've got your $150 cable bill and you think it's so much money, but you know, using that as a retention tool is super important for the MVPDs. So you know, that's what's going to get them to you know, sign those TV Everywhere deals. And it, I mean, for, for that 150 bucks, I mean, there's an enormous amount of content there. Yeah. An enormous amount. And so, you know, being able to watch several devices in the same household um, is, is a really great, great thing. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's talk about um, content consumer relationships or content owners. You know, one of the, with OTT, we're seeing a lot of activity in the last year of uh, content owners or producers going direct to consumer, or at least having differentiated offers. And you know, I was certainly going to ask uh, Mara about this as well. But you know, Tony and and the mics, what what do you guys see as the opportunities here for monetization in an OTT world for content providers? And don't announce any products or anything. <laughs> but you know, in terms of how do you think about that um, versus the traditional pay TV relationship and you know, beyond monetizing via advertising or retention, are there other opportunities that you see as particularly interesting from a monetization perspective? I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, not even talking about um, programmers like Discovery, but for all of you guys in the room, it's just an, it's an enormous opportunity. It's, you know, for the first time probably ever, I think, for maybe a couple of million dollars, any of you guys can spin up you know, what is potentially a, a, a live 24-7 network and uh, sell it to consumers directly. I mean, that's pretty great. It's, pre it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, you have the ecosystems like um, the App Store and, and Google Play. You have many platforms uh, that do all of your, your encoding, distribution, uh, take your payments, um, provide, you know, ready-built clients. So, so for any of you guys, I mean, it's, it's an enormous opportunity where all these barriers have been sort of broken through where you can get content into the hands of consumers and get paid for it. So uh, I don't think it comes down to any particular one of us that that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for everyone out there. Yeah, yeah I, I think there's two, um, thing, two items that are super interesting in terms of watching some of those trends come to life over the next uh, year or so, which is you know, what Vessel is doing in terms of the, you know, the smaller level trans uh, 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 subscriptions. Um, I think that, you know, sort of a, a non-mainstream uh, content creator creating smaller, more sort of um, easily, easily to purchase um, lower friction from that perspective offerings and seeing how well that does in terms of people, uh, just people's willingness to buy that type of content at that price point is going to be very interesting. And then the other trend that is um, equally interesting, in, in my opinion, is the, um, what's going on with the MCNs as they, the multi-channel networks, as they go off of YouTube and try to go um, into other devices where they could ostensibly make a lot more money than, um, than they can through YouTube, where they get the, you know, hit with a pretty big rev share. So, you know, that, to Tony's point, you know, it's like these are just, you know, these are just content producers that are, you know, with various levels of sophistication and the fact that they can suddenly, you know, with a bit of an audience on YouTube, suddenly be in all these places if they're willing to make not crazy expensive investments like, you know, you used to have to have when you were um, uh, having to get um, distribution deals through MVPDs, but just, you know, get onto all these devices. And the fact that a lot of that content is particularly mobile friendly, I think, makes, that, makes the mobile part of it super relevant. If I can jump on two of those themes that Mike was laying out with uh, specific examples. Um, you, you mentioned Vessel. Really interesting. I think they do 75% uh, of the ads that they do, actually, at least for their subscribers. They still have ads. It's a hybrid model. But I think they're like three to five second ads, kind of like bumpers. 
And there's been a lot of experimentation, certainly for mobile, with shorter ads. And I, I missed Mike Park's speech from Twitter this morning, but I know that he's been promoting now for a long time. <laughs> when someone cuts a 30 and cuts a 15, hey, Discovery, make sure they cut a, a six right. also. And I don't know if that's gotten any traction yet, but it seems to be there's some experimentation in that area, especially given that a lot of consumption is, is on mobile. So Vessel is definitely being creative in that area. Um, and then on the MCN side, Tastemade is a, is, a, is a Bright Cove customer with a very mobile-centric audience, a lot of really great short-form food content. I mean, I think of them almost like the food network of the MCNs that came out of you know, YouTube, and they got a strong enough brand, they raised some money, and they put out a, you know, a shingle, sort of like their own shop and their own sites and apps, and it's terrific, a terrific experience. And like we were talking about earlier, they've actually chosen to avoid some of the risks, potentially, with ad serving into mobile environments by doing a lot of integrated uh, brand sponsorship, and now they're at the scale, I think, where they can do that and know that if someone is cooking with, I don't know, Land O'Lakes butter, you don't have to worry that it's going to break over the connectivity of someone trying to watch that video in Times Square because it's in the video. And uh, they've done a really nice job of, of that, and I've gotten a lot of credit, I think, for that. And actually, you know, one thing they did do was a study with Nielsen uh, talking about brand uh, affinity and uh, I guess the, the rate at which viewers remember a brand when it's either integrated versus served as a pre-roll. And it was like 5x uh, recall when it's actually brand integrated. I mean, it supports the way they approach things, obviously. Right. But it was an interesting right. piece of data they put out. Yeah, no, that, that, um, yeah that's a great point. We hadn't talk, talked really about effectively sponsored content as another monetization uh, possibility. But well, one thing people love about that, of course, is sponsored content when it travels through social networks also avoids the fact that Facebook hasn't offered you know, a monetization solution for you yet, and Twitter has rules around the Amplify program. And so if someone's cooking with Land O'Lakes butter and the video ends up getting a ton of views on Facebook, that's probably fine with Tastemade. Right. Yeah, I guess, you know, Tony, back to your point on now the technology is there. Everybody could do this. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not a problem from a you know, implementation perspective. I think in some of the business cases, though, that we see that uh, don't underestimate the amount you're going to have to spend on raising awareness, generating awareness. I mean, look at even TV everywhere. It's uh, less than 50% of consumers, of cable TV subscribers whose providers offer uh, TV everywhere. They don't even know it exists. And that's, you know, that's very important. So if you're, a, if you're a player out there, certainly make sure you have a plan for demand generation that's economical and that that's fit into your business case. Or yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really, really good point. Um, and, and, and a bit of wisdom you've just dropped there. Um, I think over my career, I've, I've launched about, uh, well, over 300 applications, um, which is a lot. Uh, and some of them that you know, you're sure are going to be a, a, a home run. Um, get no traction, and others that you didn't really know about uh, or d didn't really have a lot of confidence in um, have been downloaded millions of times. So, um, and these have all been for big media companies and they're you know big brands that people generally know. I think building a brand from scratch um, as an OTT solution uh, is 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 really hard. You know, there's there's some really smart people in this space trying to do this, and uh, it's it's uh, it's not for the faint of heart and, and for the smaller budget. So. Um, you do need to, to, to uh, do a lot of promotion. You need to um, probably have, you know, it's, it's back to marketing 101. You know, don't try and have a, a massive offering that covers all the bases. Try and go out with some niche content that, you know, a, a small part of the market is really intensely interested in uh, because that's what you're going to capture um, potentially. Uh, and it, it's still going to take a lot of promotion. So, you know, you need to go out there. Um, you need to have not spent all of your, your operating capital just, just getting to that point, And you need to have enough cash to to be promoting this thing um, on, on many different channels to, to get an audience there. And not only to, to get a download in the first place, but to get people to keep coming back is, is really, really tough in this space. Yeah, there's a, a rule of thumb in entertainment, I think, that 50% of a production or of a budget should go to production and 50% should go to marketing. And I believe that absolutely holds true in um, OTT, whether it's mobile or um, other OTT devices. Um, we have, we have, we, we always encourage our publishers to think that way. And the other thing that's super important, and, and again, harder on mobile, where you have, which means you have to actually go elsewhere to push people into mobile, but it's working with the um, platform um, teams to actually drive that promotion. We had uh, BYU TV is an app we recently launched on Fire TV that was super successful because Fire TV did a great job promoting that in, in the, um, 
in their in their inventory in their in their environment. So you need to do that. You know, wh no matter which platform you're on, you need to drive people to that engagement in order to build the audience. Um, questions from the audience. We have about ten minutes left uh, here. So yes. Um, it's a three-parter. I'll give it to you quick. You say the CPMs are high. What are the CPMs, or at least a range of the CPMs? When you tell a client this is what the CPM is and it's real high, how do you deal with their reaction? Because they're used to the broader market, obviously. And how many clients have been able to put some sort of uh, measurement in to see their ROI on these high CPMs? OK, so uh, repeating the question. <coughs> um, CPMs are high. How high are they? And when you communicate with a client about those high CPMs, how do you deal with their reaction? Third, have any of the clients put in measurement systems to uh, measure the ROI of their campaigns? I'm going to throw to you guys for that one. I, I don't want to talk about numbers of, of <laughs> discovery CPMs. So, uh, I, I will say that, uh, you know, Brightcove has a, a broad customer base. And on the high end, you'd expect the publishers who deal with business finance type of content are 75 bucks and north, um, and that holds. I mean, that's, that number, I think, is blended from, from my perspective, desktop and, and mobile and so forth. I don't know that I've seen a huge distinction between the two. I don't really know much about how the conversation goes these days with the, the, you know, the um, you know, agencies who are making those buys. Um, I do know that there are increasingly a number of other requirements that come along with buys. You know, people want to understand viewability metrics now. They want to make sure that if they want to do something creative in terms of rich media, that it can work in all the places that they hope to execute their campaign. And that's kind of what flows into, you know, the interesting things that are going on in smart TV. You know, we have um, this, this, this product called Once. The idea there is uh, server-side ad stitching technology. It puts the ad, stitches it to the content, which ensures that if you're playing back on desktop, let's say, that ad blockers can't stop the ad from appearing because it seems that the ad is just stitched to the content and the you know, player doesn't recognize a call out to free will or double click. Uh, and at the same time, we have technology that hopefully should fire beacons uh, at certain points during playback to ensure that you know, at least X amount of the ad was viewed or that it, they made it to the content. And so all these different types of technologies that are being required essentially between the publisher and the advertiser are, are incumbent upon us as the platform partner to help execute and make sure that those, those CPMs, when they're paid, are justified. Yeah, in terms of the CPMs, I try to um, sort of share what, what I get, kind of get a sense of for, based on my research. Um, and it varies by publisher, obviously. It varies by content, by audience, et cetera. But you know, the, it seems like the, you know, to be conservative to the people that I talk to, I say it's about you know, between $25 and $35 is sort of the typical CPM. It gets as high as $50, $75, $100, $100 depending on who the audience is. Obviously, financial services is going to be super high because those are premium users. Obviously, if you get a lot of millennials, you're going to get higher CPMs. So there's a lot of variables based on your audience. If it's more tail content, it can tend to be lower as well. So it's a very nuanced um, discussion. But I try to say 25 is you know, through, the, through the ad networks, so you'll get something along those, along those lines. The other thing that's important to note is that obviously you know, there's a question of you're selling those ads directly if you're selling them through an ad network, because then they get a piece of that action as well. You know, there's typically a rev share associated with that. So, so I typically sort of um, try to make sure everybody knows sort of what the, what, not just what the economics for the CPM look, but what does the economics of the ecosystem look like. So that's in terms of the CPMs, that's how I look at it. In terms of the requirements, as Mike said, you know, there's a typically, and, and Hulu kind of set the bar here in terms of you know, quartile, um, um, quartile data about how much of an ad was viewed and only paying if there's a complete view, view of that type of thing. So that, again, varies by publisher, and it typically sort of translates to whatever they else, what other ad rules they typically have um, on other platforms that they're selling. Uh, in terms of the analytics, that's actually a really good question. We haven't talked that much about it, but we do know we spend a lot of time with Comscore and Nielsen, and they're obviously very anxious to get more and more involved in that. And um, there's, as that happens, as that third-party party validation occurs, the CPMs are only going to get more valuable because that's obviously a requirement for a lot of the advertisers that it be validated by third parties. So as Nielsen and Comscore start getting more um, more penetration into all these platforms that's going to bring up the CPMs across the board. And then the other thing is obviously a targeting uh, in and of itself can also bring more value into the, yeah. into the CPM. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good point. I can't believe we didn't mention it until now in the Q&A, but obviously the ability to do the same targeting that you might do on desktop in mobile, it's, in, it's improving, but it's not quite at parity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So there's all sorts of parameters that might get passed from someone's cookie uh, you know, browser history or whatever else um, 
that can match, particularly if you're doing programmatic, if you're experimenting with open exchanges, on desktop your fill rate might be better perhaps than on mobile. Also because if you do too much in the way of, you know, um, uh, daisy chaining and redirects and so forth, things can time out. You know, obviously a lot of our publishers choose to set a rule that say that if in 400 milliseconds you have an ad back, don't risk the brand, don't risk the consumer experience, just give them the content. Um, so there's all sorts of things that if you, but, but from our premium publisher base, the, the discoveries of the world who are doing mostly just direct sales, they're not experiencing a lot of that breakage. Other questions? Yes. So uh, I'll repeat the question. <clears throat> um, OTT today, you're pretty much saying similar ads, seeing similar ads to what you'd see on traditional TV. Other than the six second uh, ads on mobile platforms, what other innovations uh, are we seeing? I can throw out one example. Ahead, yeah. I mean, so um, with, with on-demand content as opposed to live content, you can build in some interactivity such that if somebody wants to click into the Clinique store and start looking at different, um, you know, makeups and so forth. I've seen a company like Brightline deliver that. Uh, you know, again, for a big customer that wants to use that type of ad technology, they want to make sure that in the case of it's actually a once integration that the VMAP is provided, saying all the elements that are going to come down in the stream. Can you properly instruct the player to interact and provide that level of interactivity with the end user if they're using a Roku remote or whatever it is? To, you know, there are some challenges there, but we've seen some experimentation. I would say it's fairly limited at this point from what I've seen. But. Yeah, I think along the same lines, and again, this is on a scalable um, uh, approach that works on, in mobile and tablet in particular is vPaid, which is sort of an interactive ad unit, which actually delivers um, a companion ad and sort of interactivity yeah. um, at scale. So that's actually a super valuable um, experience that is unique to mobile monetization that I think not enough people are taking advantage of. I think as people see that opportunity, they're going to start taking more advantage of that. Yeah. It's something we're contemplating from a product perspective in terms of what we're um, bringing to customers um, on mobile, and I think that's going to take off once we start getting, seeing performance metrics around that. Yeah. SDKs for native apps, mobile and in smart TV, often can handle vPaid and stuff mm -hmm. like that. You know, obviously, mobile web has limitations, and there are other areas you run into limitations for doing companion banners and overlays. Other questions? <clears throat> Dan gave us permission to go over by a couple of minutes since we started late. So uh, anything else? All right. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>